Whether it's because of fear, arrogance, or just bad writing, horror movie characters are known to make terrible decisions which often lead to themselves or others being brutally killed. Maybe it's just one bad decision, or maybe it's an entire movie's worth of mistakes that leads to their demise. I'm Jordan Kant, and today we're going to find out who could have survived Saw 3. Now before I start, let's set some ground rules. Rule 1. I will not consider a character's survival based on pure luck or information that they had no way of knowing at the point of their demise. Rule 2. If a character's death was based on the decisions of another character, I will still only be considering their survival based on the decisions they themselves could have made to survive. Rule 3. I will only take into account external factors that the character had a level of control over, such as items it would be reasonable to assume that they had access to throughout the movie. Saw 3 is the second film in the series directed by Bosman and is written by Lee Whannell and James Wan who has made a return to the series. As I said at the end of the last video, this is the Saw film that I know the least about and I think I've only seen it one time and it was many years ago. So I am both excited and nervous to try and save these characters when I know very little about how they die or the games they have to play. So, let's begin. As we hear the echoes of the shouting that ended the previous film as Detective Matthews reaches for a gun. He clearly wasn't a fan of the first film or he would have remembered the use your shirt strategy to reach the gun he is going for, but he has clearly watched my first video and he uses our favourite toilet lid to break his ankle and then remove his foot. I think it would be good to note at this point that I don't watch the film before I write the script. I write the script at the same time as watching the film and, as I said, this is the first time I've watched this film in a long time. I do this so that I can easier judge how the characters could survive based on the knowledge they know, as I feel like if I watch the whole film it would be much easier for me to use knowledge from later on in the film, consciously or subconsciously, and that would have an impact on how I decide if they could survive. And so, yes, I have to say again, I completely did not remember that this is how Eric Matthews escaped this room and it really hurt me when I had written the first script and even started filming it and then realized that me saying use the toilet lid was something that the writers had already thought of. But anyway. Eric escapes the shackles and we move on to some Are You My Mummy? gas mask wearing SWAT guys led by Lieutenant Daniel Riggs who discovers a body. I'm gonna get slated for not saying left tenant is I'm British, but... Detective Carrie is now accompanied by Mark Hoffman, who calms her panic, confirming that the body is not Eric Matthews. The body is in fact a man called Troy, who has woken up in a classroom with chains secured under his skin. He has to remove the chains from his body and leave the room within 90 seconds, otherwise a bomb will explode and kill him. However, the second catch, as Carrie notices, is the fact that the door was welded shut, so he couldn't have escaped regardless of the chains. He remanages to move all of the chains bar one secured to his jaw, and with the timer hitting zero, a bomb explodes, killing him. So Tony is dead, and my fun begins. Wow, that sounded dark. But anyway, now Tony had no way of knowing that the door was welded shut, and so I will say that to discover this would take about 10 extra seconds of his time, and so I will be trying to consider his options for survival, including an extra 10 seconds for him to discover the door is welded shut. Option 1. So having looked around the room both during the game and during the investigation, I am struggling to see anything of use to Tony to aid him removing the chains. However, for a chain to be put through his skin in such a manner that is with no breaks to the skin other than its entry point, it must not be a full circle or it must have some sort of closing mechanism or was welded shut after being pushed under the skin. Now, considering these options, as long as it wasn't welded shut, then it could be possible for Tony to break the hoops attached to his body 
rather than rip them from his body, and if he learned that was possible, then it would be much nicer than ripping it through his jaw. But as I can't guarantee that it is an option, then I will not proceed further with it. Now, as we saw, Tony managed to rip through most of the chains without too much problem, and was stuck at the chain which was through his mouth. Now, according to the only credible source on the internet, Wikipedia says that the chain encompasses the mandible, more commonly known as the jawbone. Upon research, the jawbone isn't too difficult to break for the average trained boxer punching at full power, but it is one of the strongest bones in the body. It would be nearly impossible to remove the chain forcefully without several attempts and considerably more time than what Tony had had left. It would also be very likely and possible that you would dislocate the jaw in the process of pulling the chain forward, which would make the process even more difficult and painful. However, from the look and layout of the room, it is potentially possible that Tony could have survived without ever needing to remove that chain. His mobility has greatly improved now that he only has one chain left attached to him, and so he could move around the room and there is other things he can do at this point. He can now reach the bomb as well, and from the look of the room during the investigation we can see that some chairs and tables have survived the blast with only minor damage. And so Tony could likely have reached both the bomb and a table or two to hide behind. Once he had reached the bomb, he could have thrown it across to the far corner of the room and have hidden behind a desk to block a portion of the explosion. It is hard to tell for sure, but it is certainly possible that Tony could have survived the blast. He is still trapped in the room at this point, uh, but we do know that help comes very quickly. Now, of course, I would want him to try and escape the room, but with the door being welded shut, that is near, if not impossible. So the best thing for him to do at this point would to be just to slow his bleeding and try and survive for as long as he can in the room, waiting for help, because he has really no other option at that point. If he survived the blast and help came quick enough, he could certainly have survived, but without me being able to guarantee he survives the blast or that he wouldn't bleed out in the process of waiting for other people to come and help him, then I can't say that this option is a definite way to guarantee survival. Option 2 is even more far-fetched. but. Let's just say that he could have broken the chains or have found an easier way to remove them from his body. He could have put the bomb at the door and hidden at the other side of the room behind more desks. Now, it is very unlikely as it would take an incredible amount of force to break down the welded shut door, and likely with that amount of force in an explosion, the explosion would also have killed Tony, but let's just say that it was just enough force to break down the door but not enough to kill him if he was hidden behind the desks at the other side of the room. Then the door would be open, he would have survived, and he would have been able to escape the room without any help from anyone else. But this does require there to be a way to break or remove the chains easier, and it requires the explosion to be just the perfect level of forceful to break down a door and not kill him, and so this is very much a push, a reach in the dark, and so I can't say for sure that this would be an option that would save him either. And so, Tony could not have survived. Now, we leave the crime scene to find Carrie enjoying some downtime by relaxing in a bath and watching her favourite puppet horror movie. Sorry, Chucky. But she realises that the tape is live and she's being recorded from her cupboard and after cleverly taking no risks and shooting at the door, she takes a look. But our favourite pig icon outplays her with another shaky camera attack and she wakes up in a game of her own. Her game involves her ribcage being attached to a device which will open if not unlocked, tearing her chest open, and the key to open the device is in a cup full of acid. She dips her hand in the acid a few times before finally getting the key and unlocking the trap. However, Carrie learns that she was never supposed to win this game as a female in red walks into the room. Bracing herself, Carrie grabs the chains above her as the cage opens, destroying her chest and killing her. Carrie had big main character energy in this film, considering she was just a side character in the past too, it looked like it was building to her be the main character in this film, but we're only 20 minutes in and she's already dead. Carrie was clever and knew Jigsaw's games very well, so 
Was there a way she could have played this game better to survive? Option 1 which is the only option for this one. Firstly, the glass with the key in it is attached by two chains and is seen swinging and swaying, and so the majority of the acid could have been poured out by Carrie before the key was ever at risk of being spilled onto the floor and out of her reach. So there was never any need for her to get most of her hand burnt, which of course wouldn't have saved her, but it would have saved her some pain at least. Now, her trap was never designed to be escaped, and for her to remove the mechanism from her ribs, it would have required her to break a portion of each of her ribs, or somehow remove the trap from inside her chest. And so the only way I can think of that would give Carrie even a slight chance of survival is for her to break the glass after retrieving the key. She could, in theory, do this at the start and attempt to catch the key, but that would be too risky in my opinion. And use a shard of the glass to cut open her chest around the areas that the trap is attached to her chest. She could then potentially reach inside and try to detach the trap from her ribs. Knowing that the trap must have been attached in a manner that didn't do enough damage to kill her, then it isn't too much of a push to assume that it could be detached from the inside of the body still without killing the person. But it would be extremely painful and considering that there was someone watching all this who revealed themselves, it is safe to assume assume that they wanted Carrie dead. And so sadly we are two for two. Carrie could not have survived. But could maybe have at least had the satisfaction of outsmarting Jigsaw slightly before she died. So Carrie is dead and therefore not our main character for this movie, and so let's introduce two new characters. Meet Dr. Lynn Denlon and her husband Jeff. What is it you want from me, Chris? Divorce. Oh, maybe not for long though. Okay, so quick interjection. I was just editing this video um, and I, it's literally only at this point now. I did say I'd rarely watch this film that I realized that Jeff is not the guy in bed with Lynn at the start. When she first appears, that's a guy called Chris who she's having an affair with. So if I ever get that wrong, yeah, I did. Sorry. <laughs> the more you know. Anyway, back to the video. We get a small taste of the medical drama this movie is about to become as Denlin saves a child's life. Lynn gets locked in the changing room at the end of her shift and our favourite pig icon, who's now wearing mostly black with only hints of red, attacks Lynn as she wakes up with a very different style of game to what we're used to. Amanda is back and takes Lynn to see Kramer. Kramer asks her how long he has to live and after a lot of medical lingo that neither Kramer nor I understood, she says that he doesn't have long left. Lynn asks what he wants from her, which is a question she regrets quickly. Her game is simple. She has a bomb necklace around her neck, which will detonate when Kramer's heart rate monitor flatlines. She must keep him alive until a different player playing different games completes his challenges. The other player we learn to be her husband Jeff, who is going to face challenges which will cause him to suffer and allow him the chance to forgive those who killed his son. He is told he has two hours to complete all of the challenges and if he is successful, he will get to meet the person who is responsible for the death of his son. Jeff wakes up in a box which is several feet off the ground and upon trying to break it, he tips the box over and falls. The box smashes but Jeff is knocked out and sent straight into a flashback nightmare where we learn that he has a daughter who he doesn't want going through his son's being her brother's stuff. She apologizes to her dad and leaves him alone as he is kidnapped by our pig friend. The dream's jump scare wakes him up as he stumbles his way to a note, a picture, and a key. Back to our medical drama as Amanda informs Kramer and Lynn that the game has begun, and when Lynn is sassy about John's condition, Amanda doesn't react well. Kramer doesn't appreciate his prodigy reacting this way, but his outbursts cause him to have convulsions. The doctor leaps into action with Amanda's help and they manage to control the situation and lucky for Lynn, Kramer survives it. Seeing how bad Kramer's situation is, Amanda agrees to get all of the medical supplies that Lynn needs to attempt surgery. Back to Jeff who uses a key to open a door after finding another clue. He finds his way into a massive freezer with a naked woman chained in the middle. He finds a tape which explains that this woman in front of him named Damica 
was the only witness at the scene of his son's death, but she fled the scene, and he needs to retrieve a key from behind some rather nippy pipes to unlock the chains before she freezes to death. To make matters worse, she is being sprayed by cold water periodically to help her freeze quicker. Jeff debates his options for a long enough time to show that he is an asshole, cause like come on dude, she doesn't deserve to die for simply being too scared to come forward for a crime she didn't commit but only witnessed. But by the time he changes his mind, she is pretty much already frozen solid. Jeff eventually gets the key but with the lock also covered in ice, he gives up. Now, could she have survived? Absolutely, but Jeff didn't act quick enough, and there isn't much point in me saying that he could have acted faster because he clearly was never going to do that. But is there a way that she could have survived, assuming Jeff only started helping her when he did? Okay, so after doing a lot, and I mean a lot of research into the freezing time and temperatures of moving water, compared to the strength of gravity causing the water to run, compared to the natural friction of water against skin, I learned that the time it would take for someone to freeze over completely in the same way that Damika did is a while depending on the temperature of the freezer. There is a lot of varying factors which essentially cause it to be impossible to determine this without knowing the exact temperature of the water and freezer, as well as the speed at which it's moving and the size of each body of water, and actually assuming she had been in that room for at least 10 minutes before Jeff had even arrived, and for another at least 5 once he had arrived, she would certainly have gotten hypothermia regardless. And once the water had started spraying, it would have only been a matter of minutes before she likely hit exhaustion and lost consciousness, at which point it would be very difficult for Jeff to ensure she didn't die within the next couple of hours, even if he did get her out of the freezer. Saying that, it wouldn't have been impossible. Now, with the time taken to complete this trial a mystery because of the way it has been filmed, my options to save Damika are pretty loose, but potentially options. Option 1. Damika should have moved as much as she could have while chained up. Now, moving circulates the blood and heats up your limbs, which is surprisingly very counterintuitive in freezing conditions, as you want to retain as much of the heat as you can to survive for as long as you can. But given that Damika is in a situation where she knows she has but minutes left alive, she should definitely have been wiggling and shaking and doing everything she could have with the energy she had left to both circulate the blood warming her limbs, as well as displacing the water landing on her, causing it to freeze ever so slightly slower. This wouldn't have bought her much time, but it might have bought her enough for Jeff to have acted quick enough to save her. Option 2. Now, this doesn't really have much to do with Damika, but considering it was actually Jeff's game to play, then I think this is a viable option in that it is the type of game he was only supposed to be able to win and she was never supposed to be able to win on her own. And so, let's start with Jeff not wanting to touch the pipe with his face. Well, I've used this a few times, but Jeff could easily have taken off or moved a piece of his clothing to protect his face, and so that's that problem solved instantly. But let's say that he still can't get the key into the lock due to it already being frozen over. He should have smashed the ice around the chains and used the key, removing Damika's frozen body from the freezer and allowing it to thaw out. Now, it is rare, but there are known cases of resuscitation hours after a person has died from freezing. But to do this, they would need to be resuscitated as soon as the body thawed out, as the longer the body is left to adjust to room temperature, the smaller the chances are of the body being revived. And so it is slightly possible that even after being frozen, Damika could have been revived by Jeff had he left her to defrost. But considering he had other things to do within his two hour time limit, this is also likely not an option. Now, I think that the freezing over of Damika's skin was more for effect than for science, as to create that thicker layer of ice over some, someone's body, no matter the temperature, would take a fair amount of time. And so, it's hard to base this on a scientific explanation, but these are the conditions that our characters found themselves in, and so those are the conditions that I will judge their survival on. And so considering both these options, and including the fact that Jeff only started helping when he did, Damika could have survived. 
the trap at least in the freezer, but probably not the two hours afterwards. I just got up to boil the kettle, didn't realize how much of a blonde Justin Bieber look I was going for today, but uh, as you'll have seen in recent videos, my hair is very long right now, and so there's not many options for it, so <sighs> this is what you're getting. Jeff finds another clue with a bullet, and we are back to Dr. Lin, who gets a heckin' spook from a reverse bear trap that explodes, and Amanda hits with the heckin' spook double tap as she does what I'm supposed to be doing, and explains to Lin all the various options she has to try and escape, and all the faults and flaws in all of these plans. We find out Kramer has a part-time job as a puppet painter and watch a flashback where he sets up Amanda's game and begins her journey of becoming his prodigy. Jeff finds a nicely placed Billy who is recreating the accident that kills his son and then promptly laughs in his face before Jeff stumbles into another game. Another game means another victim and this one is a man called Holden who was the judge who gave Jeff's son's killer to light a punishment. The game again is pretty simple with no extra clues or hints, but basically our judge is padlocked to the bottom of a big empty Heinz baked bean can, which will start being filled with pig guts to make the sausage and bean combo tin. There is a key hidden in a room which is filled with possessions that once belonged to Jeff's son, and if he incinerates them all, he will be able to get the key and free Judge Holden. Of course, our favourite good guy Jeff debates what he'll do for quite a while, but this time he does act quick enough and retrieves the key with enough time to save Judge Halden's life. Now, Halden survived this game, but as a quick extra analysis, he does just kind of lie there at the end entirely giving up. Which is totally understandable if that is the type of person you are, but there are totally ways in which he could have still fought to at least buy himself a couple extra minutes instead of accepting his death. He could certainly have used his hands to create a sort of funnel for his mouth, giving him at least a couple extra inches of depth that the fat will need to reach before he's breathing it in, and so this is, a, this is an air tunnel that he could have been using to at least buy himself an extra minute. Although saying that, had he done that, he would have again just been delaying his death had Jeff never actually helped him. As an extra, extra analysis, I did have the thought that had he been completely submerged in the pig guts, then he could have adopted a water bending skill that I know we have all at some point utilised, where he uses his, as much of his body as he can to slowly manipulate the water into a tide. You know that thing where you used to move your body back and forth when you were in a pool or in a bath or something and the water would come with you and it would sort of create an ebb and flow where it was shallow at some points and you would just keep going because it got really fun and then you would spill water all over onto the floor and it would just... Sorry, mom. Well, had he done that, then he could have created a tide in which it was deep and then shallow and then deep and then shallow at the point that he was trying to breathe. And so had he moved it and created even a circular flow, any sort of flow, he would have points periodically where he could breathe. Now this would take a lot of effort and it's hard to say whether the amount of energy he's using would make it that he would need to breathe even more to get the blood flow and the circulation. So I don't know if this would be a positive thing, but you know, it's quite a funny image, thinking uh, in a soft film, some guy's just like, yeah, I'm gonna survive. I just spat. I'm using that take anyway. But yeah, no need to say whether he would have or would not have survived, because he did survive, but I, I would say, along with everything else in this film, he, he couldn't have survived on his own. And, but could have bought himself a couple more minutes. Back to Grey's Anatomy as Lynn checks out Kramer's luscious hair before drilling off a piece of his skull to relieve the pressure of his brain pushing against his skull. This scene is long and intense and certainly too long for me to use a lot of the clips from, but if you like medical stuff with a lot of gore, then watch this scene. 
I can't vouch for the medical accuracy of the scene, but I can vouch for its intensity and gore. Kramer briefly passes out and has a dream about a woman he once loved, which is a face you should remember, even though he doesn't, as he tells Lynn he loves her much to the disdain of Amanda. This sends Amanda into a flashback where we learn that it was her who kidnapped Adam in the first film and not Zepp. Not only did she kidnap him, but she also helped Kramer set up the entire game involving Adam, Lawrence, and our favourite toilet lid. We jump to an unconscious Adam post-first movie, who Amanda frees by suffocating him to death. We already knew he was dead after seeing his corpse in the second film, but now that we have seen it happen, it is finally time to see if we could save him. And oh boy, do I wish I had done this in the first film instead of now, because I can't remember half of the things that happened in the first film, but here we go. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say will probably echo things I said in my first video, or also echo my plan for Loris's escape, but considering their circumstances are almost identical, it, it was inevitable that this was going to be the case. Option 1. Now, I'm going to call this option one even though technically it is many options, but they all lead to the outcome of escaping before he is locked in the game. The key is gone as it was a complete accident that it was lost and so there was no way for him to know how to save it. The game begins as soon as he realises that he needs to get out of the chains. Similarly to Lawrence, I believe that he should have tried to break or cut through the rusted pipes instead of damaging his foot to escape. I think if the pipes were relatively rusty then he could have done quite well with breaking them with the toilet seat, but if that was not an option then he should have removed or destroyed his foot enough to escape the chains. Assuming he doesn't succeed with this and that he is left alone trapped in the room after his game ends, then let me hit you with a few more options. Option 2. How long he is left in the room is unknown, but considering that he didn't die from starvation or dehydration, then it can't have been more than a couple days that he was left before anyone or Amanda came to see him. We see that he is left in complete darkness, and so likely is no longer being monitored, and would at least know if he was by the light from the camera still being on. At which point in the darkness he should have reached for the toilet lid and have broke his foot, making his escape and then way to the door. Now we hear from the click at the end of the first film that the door is likely locked and so reaching it wouldn't make him able to escape. Now assuming it was locked, he should just wait in a sort of sneak attack position with either the gun that was left in the room from Zepp or the toilet seat that we know can kill people because he's done it before. He should wait till someone enters the room and then he should get the jump on them, surprise attacking them, obviously easier with the gun, but if not, with the toilet seat, and kill them. When he kills them, the door is then open and unlocked and he can just easily make his escape, at least out of the bathroom. Beyond that, it is hard to say, but if he had a loaded gun, that could potentially go quite well for him. If he just had a toilet seat, he would have to be more careful, but it is at least one step further to his survival. Now, of course, similarly to Lawrence, he could die from his injuries by either going into shock or if he has to deal with his crushed or cut off foot for long enough, then he could die from an infection or bleeding out or any other cause like that. And so this isn't without its fault, but it is certainly a better option than him just lying there accepting and giving up. Option 3, which is pretty much just option 2 but in a different order. This option reduces his risk of dying from injury, but does increase his risks elsewhere in the plan. So if the gun is within reach of Adam, either using the shirt method or any other means, then that's great, as he now has a loaded gun to his access and can at least sit there knowing he's armed. But from how far we see him toss it when he gets electrocuted, it is not likely that it is within his reach, even using the shirt method. But the toilet lid certainly is within his reach. He should have placed the toilet lid somewhere very close to him, but in an unobvious and unassuming position. He should have then used the water and swampy gross looking stuff in the toilet to make the floor around his body slightly wet. At least the point where if someone was to walk near him, they would step on the wet floor. And at this point, he just waits. 
He waits until someone enters, which of course could technically be never, and so this might not work, but if someone enters the room and he has the gun, then great. He just waits till they get close enough to him for him to safely shoot them and then acquire any keys or items that they will have on their person, and then that's that. But if he doesn't have the gun, then he should wait till the person walks close enough and over the wet floor and if anyone else can vouch for this, uh, wet tiled floors are always slippy and often end in many bruises. Um, there are sh so many stories behind that, but none for today. If they step on the wet floor and slip, they will hit the ground and be stunned momentarily. At this point, he should take the toilet lid and do exactly what he did to Zep and just hit them over the head as many times as he can knocking them out quickly and killing them further if he wants to. Now, if this person has a key on them to his shackles, then great, he can use that key, but it isn't likely that they would considering Amanda only went in to kill him, and that seems like they're the only person that visited him. And so he would then have the problem of needing to very quickly escape his shackles, as he has now killed someone who there is likely someone else waiting on, and when they don't return, they'll go, mm, something's not right here. And so this is when panic mode sets in. Adam would have to take the toilet lid and mangle his foot again in the same math as we've described before, and then make his escape probably much speedier this time, but he would have been injured for much less time. As I said, this would greatly reduce his risk of dying from his injuries as they would be fresh and new and he wouldn't have to worry about lying in the toilet room for two days, three days, maybe even longer with a broken foot. But it does also increase much more to the risk of the other person just straight up beating him in a fight. If he's still chained, he could be electrocuted and if they don't get too close to him or just notice that he has a weapon, they could be much more careful about the situation. I personally think that option 2 is better than option 3 just because the pros seem to outweigh the cons in that one, but I think that because he had no idea if he was ever going to be able to leave that room or if anyone was ever going to visit him, then there was no harm in him breaking his ankle, retrieving the gun or toilet lid, and getting ready for a fight. For all he knew, he was going to be left there to die anyway, and so if he breaks his foot, then it's either going to allow him to maybe escape better, or kill him quicker. Either way, it's not really adding to the risk of him just being left there to die. It's hard to know what could have happened had he made it out the room, as there are a lot of different things that could have come in his way to stop him getting any further, but I will say in terms of escaping the bathroom with his life, Adam could have survived. And so yeah, our main character from the first film died within seconds of being in this one, and there is much more death to come. But that will have to wait for part two, because for now, we're gonna stop this film here. Obviously I have written the full script, but I'm stopping halfway as per with the episode. Um, ooh, but I'm nervous and excited for the next death coming up. Anyone that has seen the film will know what it is, but uh, just a pre-warning, uh, it's disgusting. It's one of the few that, few things, not few deaths, one of the few things in gore that really just, I actually, my hairs are sticking up just thinking about it. But again, that will have to wait. And so for now, thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw, then hit the like button. And if you're new to the channel, I'd love you to stick around and hit the subscribe button. If you disagree with any of what I've said, have your own ideas of how people could have survived, or just want to say hi, then stick that in the comments below. If you want something a little bit more lighthearted, then check out my other series on my channel, which is just what I get up to on a week-to-week -week basis in a vlog, and although I think I'll have posted a few of them by this point, my other other series on my channel where I tell you personal stories or personal opinions on everything that is in the world of horror movies. Be kind and stay safe, and thank you for watching Could They Have Survived Saw 3?